God, if you would, let's all stand 772 when we all get to heaven. We'll sing all four verses. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the hands of pride and blessing, we prepare the spring. When we all come in heaven, one day I'll trust in the wind. When we all come in Jesus, we'll sing and shout with the wind. How we walk the pilgrim's path when clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow of a sigh. When we all fall into heaven, what a day of mercy that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us sing be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. to start a Wednesday night service. That's a good song, isn't it? When we all get to heaven, and I hope everyone in the room tonight has full confidence that that's where you're going. I believe you do. It's good to see you tonight. I feel like I haven't seen you in two months. You know, you miss uh, Wednesday night and then all day on a Sunday, and it, it just kind of takes you out of your life rhythm, doesn't it? But it is good to see you. Everybody looks like they've fared well through the big snow event. I think you have. Anybody fall? I fell. It's, it's not funny. Y'all are laughing at me just like Amy did. Listen, I have never in my life had a bad fall. All right? I have gone down on my knees. I've gone down on my backside, things like that. But, I mean, I fell and kept falling. That first day we had the snow, I had to go back behind my house to take care of something. So I had on a pair of those green muck boots. You know what I'm talking about? Those rubber green boots about over my pants and everything. So I walked back there, did what I needed to do, come back in our garage. There are three concrete, slick concrete steps going up into our house. I navigated those well going up. I reached in and grabbed what I needed, and I turned around. I didn't think about the snow having melted on the bottom of my boots. And I hit that first step, and my legs went that way. And my side, my right side, went down into the garage. I'm quite certain I cracked a rib. I'm, I'm really, I really believe I did. Of course, I didn't go to the doctor. So I don't know that that's the case, but I can tell you this, I could barely move the next couple of days. And I did that, my sweet wife was there, she watched the whole thing, 
And can you believe she laughed at me? <laughs> she did. And you know what I finally had to say? I said, honey, if you've got to laugh, you need to go to another part of the house. <laughs> because my ego can't take it. And uh, I just don't need to be laughed at right now. It knocked the breath out of me. I hadn't had the n breath knocked out of me since playing football back in the day. So it was quite the event, but here we are, and I hope nobody else had an experience like that. We did see a lot of beautiful sights, though, didn't we? Isn't it just beautiful? I remarked to uh, the classes this week down at the Bible College that they are fortunate, those that live on campus, because, you know, these days you can be in Kentucky for three or four years and maybe not see a big snow. You know, we're far enough south that we might not get it. We're far enough north that we could get it. You know how that goes. And so I told them, I said, count yourself as some of the fortunate ones that you got to be in these hills of southeast Kentucky and see this winter wonderland. And so uh, they seem to have enjoyed it. I know they enjoyed having classes canceled last week. Uh, but we made up for all that, and here we are tonight. Who has some good news to share? Maybe something that you experienced through the snow, something that God revealed to you when you looked out into the wonder of creation, or, or maybe just something else that you have on your heart. But good news to share. We like to start with good news on Wednesday nights. Going once. Yes. No. Um, the experience at work today has been kind of crazy, as I've seen on the news, it's been kind of crazy in our offices, but um, a gentleman was over here in some of the chaos, and he just said, can I pray for you all? And we were like, sure. And he just stopped and prayed a good prayer right there with us. Amen. How beautiful is that? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. We've been praying in Sunday school for Jeff's nephew that was awaiting a liver transplant. He was really, really sick. And he had that a week ago Saturday. And he's gone through the ICU recovery and got to come home, I think it was yesterday. So, Amen. Amen. Jeremy Thompson's recovering from that. Praise the Lord. Very good. Anybody else? What about a pretty sight? Did anybody see anything just spectacular when you looked out when that snow was fresh earlier last week? Yes, sir. I've seen rabbit tracks on my porch all over there. Rabbit tracks. <laughs> That's rabbit a good sign rabbits around. Yeah. Amen. I yes, Al. We've seen these ones in a while. We saw like 300 in the field. I mean, it was crazy. Canadian geese, wow. Geese, saw a bunch of geese. And those things can be ornery, though. They, they, yes. Uh, my crazy son was laying out in the snow with two shorts and a shirt. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Cooper and Al. That makes a parent quiet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was waiting with bated breath all week because so many people were doing that snow angel challenge, and I was like, don't do that to me. <laughs> I couldn't have done it because I literally, most of last week, I was really, really sore. And uh, I was like, you know, it's almost like a double dog dare if they put it on social media. You almost have to do it. And I was like, please don't let that happen. And so I guess that's my testimony tonight, <laughs> is that uh, nobody, nobody did that to me. Well, tonight I do want to invite you. There, there's little flyers out there if you want to take one, give it to somebody else. Our Andrew's birthday is Saturday. Uh, it's his 18th birthday. And the Chick-fil-A over in Somerset is partnering with our foundation, and they're going to celebrate his birthday all day from the time they open at 6.30 till the time they close at 10 o'clock Saturday night. And if you happen to be traveling through Somerset or you just want to eat chicken, 
And you like Chick-fil-A. How many of you like Chick-fil-A? Most of us do. It's the Lord's chicken, right? <laughs> but uh, that, that's just a spectacular thing they've done. And so if you are that way and you want Chick-fil-A, if you'll just mention Andrew's name or the Go Get Them Foundation, they will donate whatever you purchase. A portion of that will go to the foundation. Um, I, I do want to thank God for... Uh, just the blessing of what that is doing. We had uh, a teacher from one of the schools contact us this week, and uh, she has a student that was signed up. This is the tw twice now that this has happened. One was back in November, and then this week, a student was signed up for a trip, and you know, one of the parents came from a broken home. One of the parents did not do their part of paying for the trip, and it looked like it wasn't going to be able to go. And she remembered, you know, last time I talked to Alan, he told me about this. And so she reached out, foundation approved it very quickly, and we were able to pay for that child to get to go do what they're going to do. So we're excited about that. Thank God for all the people that have been a blessing to the foundation. But yeah, if you're, if you're over that way Saturday, uh, his, his exhibit will be set up inside Chick-fil-A. And so if you come inside, some of us will be there uh, all day long. Now, I'm not going to be there from 6.30 to 10, <laughs> but I'll be there part of that, and Amy will be, and our extended family, and some of Andrew's best friends will be there. And so we're thankful that... Um, Neat things are happening, and we get to celebrate his birthday. Uh, yeah. Speaking of Saturday, the ladies' meeting, we, we canceled our ladies' meeting for Monday, mm -hmm. and we have rescheduled it to Saturday. We're going to meet in the Somerset, so we can oh. have lunch at the chicken. What time are you going to be there? At 11. I'll be there. All right. You can. Thank you. It's so, so special. Who else? I didn't mean to get emotional. I share that as a blessing, okay? It's a blessing that we, we get to um, celebrate his birthday that way this year. Anybody else? Anyone else? We've not done this in a few weeks, so let's have just some heart prayer tonight. So I would encourage you just to bow your heads, close your eyes, so that you can just kind of close out uh, the room and the world, and just think about the Acts model that we've used several times before. It's helpful to me. I hope it's helpful to you. We begin our prayer time with adoration. So just take a few moments from your heart to adore the Lord. Tell Him how much you love Him. C is for confession. Tonight, if you need to take a moment just to confess anything to the Lord, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment to confess. T stands for thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. So let's take just a moment and express our gratitude to the Lord. S is for supplication. God supplies our needs. So if you have a need in your life, 
in the life of a family member, a friend, something that you know about that only God can meet, would you take that now to him in prayer? Father, we just want to thank you tonight that we can come together. Father, we had a difficult week last week with the weather, but it was beautiful in so many ways. And Father, thank you for giving us uh, the mercy and the grace that we all experienced and leading us safely through all of those things. Father, thank you that we can, in the middle of this week, come together as a family. Father, we're more than friends, although we are friends, but Father, we are a family of faith united together through the blood of Christ. Thank you for the unity that we experience when we come together, and thank you, Father, that we can fellowship, we can shake hands, we can hug necks, we can smile at one another, and Father, Thank you that that is a premium for you, Lord. You you want your children to be in good harmony. And Father, I believe you're pleased tonight when you see this, a group of people bonded together through Christ, loving on one another and praising you. Lord, just pray that you open our hearts and our minds for what we are to discuss tonight. Thank you, Lord, up front for the Word. Lord, it is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our path, and we pray tonight that you would use this. So much of this, Lord, is history, but it's your history of how, Father, you breathed out a Word and you protected it, and, Father, you used a lot of people to bring it to the place where We who speak and read the English language can read it and understand it for ourselves. Lord, help us to never take that for granted, but help us to be amazed by the story of the Bible tonight. I pray and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to go back to our study. We've probably got another couple of weeks after tonight uh, leading up to where I want us to be tonight we're going to get to English. You know, we've started with how Scripture was breathed out by God in the Old Testament in both Hebrew and Aramaic, and then in the Greek language in the New Testament. But ultimately, we're going to begin to see it unfold of how it got into the form that you and I know, and that is into the English Bible but to just whet our appetite for a conversation about the Word of God, I want to share a little bit with you from a lecture that I shared with my students this morning on Wednesday mornings. I'm teaching this class about um, discipleship and family ministry. In other words, you know, the, the goal of the church is not to just equip young people and families when they come to church, but we want to equip families so that the families go back and they disciple one another in the home. And so the underpinning for that whole class that I'm sharing this semester is Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so I want to show you a part of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and to help us understand it, I'll set it very briefly in context. The book of Deuteronomy is Moses preparing the people of God to live successfully in the promised land. They've been in their wanderings for 40 years now. Moses knows that he's about to exit the scene. You remember in Numbers chapter 20, Moses struck the rock rather than speaking to the rock. 
And God said to Moses, because you did not believe me to honor me in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you and Aaron are not going to cross over. You're not going to go into the promised land. Moses understood that. He's about to die, literally. And he'll be handing off the mantle of leadership to Joshua. And so through the book of Deuteronomy, God speaking through Moses to the ancient Israelites, teaching them how to live successfully in the promised land. And so the week before last, we missed last week because of the weather, and then this morning I was laying the biblical foundation because this whole class is built on the principles of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the fourth principle, and if you'd be interested in seeing all these, I'd be glad to share them with you, but this just really sets the stage to our conversation tonight. The fourth one, and I chose to use the word indoctrinate. That's not always a word that uh, is well received, but it's actually a good word. And so the purpose of family discipleship is to indoctrinate the youth of the family with the Word of God. Now, what does it mean to indoctrinate? To pour doctrine into, right? What is our doctrine? Our doctrine is that set of biblical beliefs that we hold as a church, as a family of faith. Our doctrine is biblical doctrine, and it's distinctly Baptist because we are Baptist, right? Now, we're Biblicists more than we are Baptists, but we're Baptists, I believe, because we understand Baptist doctrine being biblical doctrine and, and holding most faithfully to Scripture. I've said it like this many times. You show me another group that's more faithful to the Word of God, then I'll go join that group. I don't know another group that is. And so that's why I'm a Baptist. But to indoctrinate is really a good thing. And I would say to you, we need to indoctrinate our children more and more with the Word of God. And that's exactly what Moses was saying here in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Uh, scripture says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So I laid down the foundation that to indoctrinate, we have to do it diligently because that's what the Bible says there in verse 7. You are to teach this diligently, the Word of God, the doctrine from Scripture. You're to teach it diligently to your children. Little English language lecture here. Diligently is what part of speech? It's an adverb, all right? So most words that end with an L-Y are adverbs. They're there to modify the verb. So the verb here is shall teach, diligently describes how we shall teach. But actually in the Hebrew, it's not an adverb, but it's a verb that literally means to sharpen. It's the idea of an engraver who takes a chisel to a large piece of stone, and he begins to chisel out an image into that stone. Indoctrinating diligently means that we help our children receive the Word of God in their hearts. Now, I don't know about you, but my boys, I wanted them to hold deeply the Word of God. I wanted the Word of God to be in their hearts. Because I'll tell you this, the world is certainly indoctrinating them. You better believe it. So if you struggle with the word indoctrination, and you think that's not a good word, 
I promise you, when your youth, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your children, when they are under the influence of other people, they are being indoctrinated. It happens every day. A lot of times very subtle ways, and sometimes in not so subtle ways. And so if the world, if the hellish system of the world is out there to indoctrinate our kids, should we not indoctrinate them with the right thing, with the Word of God? And so it's done diligently because that's how the Bible says we're to do it. It ought to be done daily. Notice how Moses says to talk of the Word of God, Scriptures, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. There's a Hebrew word, it's shir, and it means to have a formal lecture. In other words, you've got a group of students there, and you have a teacher in front of the students, and that teacher is presenting a formal lecture, but that is not the word that is used here. It's the word debar that simply means to have a simple conversation. I, I talked to my class this morning about the difference between something being taught and caught. You know what I'm talking about? Something that's taught is conveyed through lessons, through lectures, etc. Something that's caught is something that's modeled right? You, you see the model of it. You see somebody living out the precepts and the principles, and that's the idea here, that we are to live out the principles of God's Word in our homes just in our daily lives. We're to talk about God's precepts when we sit down, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise. We're to do it daily but we're to do it deliberately. Notice how Moses says, you bind them as a sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your homes and on your gates. He's using hyperbole there. He, he's really emphasizing the nature of doing this deliberately. Make sure you do it. Uh, Jewish people, very religious Jewish people, take these words literally. I want to show you this picture, and that's a picture of an IDF soldier, an Israeli Defense Force soldier. And do you see what's wrapped up around his arm? You see the leather that goes around and around his arm? It's kind of dark. Let me see if I can grab my pointer here. No, that's my highlighter. I don't want my highlighter. I want my pointer. Where's my pointer? Laser pointer. There we go. Can you see where I'm pointing out right now? That dark place there in the very corner of the fold of his elbow. You can't see it well on the screen up there. The fidelity's not sharp enough. You could see it if you were looking at my computer. That's a little box. And so, religious Jewish people will quote Scripture, the Torah, the law, as they're wrapping that around their arm, and right there in the crease of the elbow will be that box. Now, if you had a little box sitting in the crease of your elbow, do you think you would know it's there? Yeah, because you couldn't do what? You really couldn't bend your arm because you have a, a little black leather box sitting there. Well, guess what they put inside of that little leather black box? Scripture. So they take this very literally. You know, where Moses says to put them on your arm, on your being, they do that. They're called phylacteries. This is one that goes on the head. That's an Orthodox Jewish man at the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And I don't have to point that out to you because I think you can see that leather box right up there on his forehead. And so he's taking this 
very literally. He's taking the Word of God, writing it down on a little piece of parchment, rolling it up, and putting it in that phylactery box, binding it as a frontlet on his forehead. This is what they call a mezuzah. And if you ever get to visit Israel, you'll see these everywhere, all the hotel rooms. When you go into your hotel door, on the side of it, on the doorpost, I promise you there will be a mezuzah. If you go to visit in a Jewish home, even in America, they'll usually have a mezuzah. And that's where they're taking what uh, Moses says here, literally writing out Scripture, rolling it up, and putting it on their doorpost. Well, let me ask you this. Would it be very possible to take Scripture, write it out, attach it to your elbow crease, write it out and attach it to your forehead, write it out and attach it to your doorpost, would it be possible to do all those things and really not be a person of the Word? Absolutely. Just like it's very possible for one of us to have a copy, a printed copy of the Word of God, to say that we cherish it, to say that that is our book, but it never influences the way we live. So it's not about taking this literally, as our Jewish friends often do, but it's about being deliberate with our indoctrin indoctrination to read the Word of God, to meditate on the Word of God, to memorize the Word of God. We've gotten away from that. When I was a little boy growing up, I sound old all of a sudden. <laughs> but listen, when I was a little boy growing up, do you, do you know what we had in Sunday school? A memory verse. We don't do that anymore. But we ought to memorize the Word of God. Lord, your Word I have hidden in my heart that I might not do what? Sin against you. Makes a difference when we make the Word of God in our hearts. And so three deliberate lessons that we ought to be talking about in our home is, children, how do you find the will of God? How do you obey the Word of God? And how do you walk in the ways of God? Those are deliberate discussions that we ought to have between ourselves, with our children, with our children's children, because always remember this, a culture is one generation away from losing it. That's all that it takes. So I just wanted to share that with you tonight to, to help you think about why it's important that we understand the Bible and its origins and how it came to us. I'm going to roll through some of this pretty quickly because it's just a review of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But if you remember... We concluded at the place that we had the New Testament, and it was already known throughout the world by the time Emperor Constantine first legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire in about A.D. 313. I say that again just to remind you that if you're ever in a discussion and somebody offers to you, well, those 27 books of the New Testament were canonized and put together by a Roman emperor because he wanted to use it to keep his subjects under control and that kind of thing. The fact of the matter is, we saw the last time we were together that Peter was already talking about Paul's writings and Paul was already talking about Luke's writings and so before you get out of the first century, you begin to see that the New Testament books were beginning to be circulated and they were beginning to be equated with Scripture. You remember how we looked at that? 
how the Old Testament was quoted and then a New Testament writing was quoted and Paul called them both what? Scripture. All right. So Constantine did not, there is no historical record that Constantine ever had any impact or influence on how the books of the Bible, the books particularly of the New Testament, came together. Books of the New Testament by the 400s, we looked at last time, there was this consensus throughout the churches. 27 books of the New Testament could be traced back to the testimony of an apostle or by someone who was a close associate with the apostle. And this consensus was confirmed by church fathers. They left records of it like Athanasius and Jerome and Augustine leaving records of there being a canon of 27 New Testament book and there had been three councils of the church by 397 that confirmed those 27 books. This gets us up to where I want us to be tonight. Let me tell you about the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate. You never dreamed you'd come to church Bible Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Kentucky, and somebody talked to you about something that sounds vulgar. It actually comes from the same root word as the word vulgar. I'll explain that in a minute. So there was this man back in the 300s by the name of Jerome. Prior to this, the Old Testament Scriptures existed in scrolls of the original Hebrew and some portions, as we've talked about before, in Aramaic. And in AD 382, he finished it up, 23 years later, Jerome began to translate the Old Testament Hebrew and Aramaic into Latin. So you see a little artist's rendition of Jerome there doing that. If you can go back, and remember our conversation around Christmas time, how we talked about the cave that's under the church of the Holy Nativity, where we believe that Jesus was likely born, all of those things. A portion of that same cave system was occupied by Jerome. So he wanted to go to the place where Jesus was born, and he set up camp in that cave and right there in that cave, he began to translate the Hebrew scrolls that he had access to into Latin. That term, Latin Vulgate, comes from vulgo, which our word vulgar, if we use the term vulgar, we're talking about common, although vulgar language as we know it to be shouldn't be common language, but that's the origin of it. That's not good language. That's blackguardish. That's common language that ought not be used. Anyway, so he, he translates Hebrew Scripture into a common accessible form. And so for many, many years, it was the official Bible of the churches that were in fellowship with the Bishop of Rome. Now, who's the bishop of Rome? Who's the bishop of the church of Rome? The pope, right. And so, for, for many years, the Latin Vulgate would be what the church at Rome would use. Now, just keep that in mind. I'm going to do a little bit of a Hail Mary here because I need you to know a little bit about the Masoretes. I know that looks like Masoretes but you pronounce it Masoretes. The Masoretes were a group of Jewish scholars and scribes who preserved the Hebrew and the Aramaic scriptures. And so they're left in Israel. As a matter of fact, up in the Galilee area, in South Galilee, right on the bank of the Sea of Galilee, the premier town there is called Tiberias. 
And so the Masoretes were centered around that town, Tiberias, and they were there from about 400 to 1,000, and they really copied Scripture in a more elaborate way. And let me describe what I mean by that. They would take the Hebrew and the Aramaic that did not have written vowels. I want you to see, I, I actually put a couple of things there. There's my little pointer working up there. Can you see my pointer? It's not as big maybe as it ought to be. But these are Hebrew words. And it's actually two renditions of the same Hebrew word. It's the word shalom. Shalom. Shalom means peace. It's, it's part of Jerusalem. Shalom. The city of Jerusalem has that in its name, city of peace. Well, i just show you this word. Before the Masoretes, the script in black is what the Hebrew would have looked like. And by the way, Hebrew is written from right to left. We're used to reading words what? Left to right. Hebrew is the opposite of that. If you're... How many left-handed friends do I have in the room tonight? You need to learn Hebrew because you can write the way that you want to write then, from right to left instead of from right, left to right. So, shalom, this is the word shalom here, and you'll notice in the black you don't have certain things. You see the points right there and right there and then down below. Those are vowel points. They did not exist until the Masoretes. I'm just showing you how they took the Hebrew language and they made it into a form that a lot of other people could begin to read and to study and try to understand. There was no vowel system before the Masoretes. These are just consonants. These are consonants with those vowel points. So I just wanted to show you again how the Masoretes began to add some technical things to the Hebrew language that made it more accessible. So they, they had those vowel points to guide readers. They kept statistics. The Masoretes have left behind for us statistics and you know, it's fascinating that they did it because right now you can have a, a really inexpensive Bible program or even use a free one on the internet like um, Blue Letter Bible. Have any of you ever used the Blue Letter Bible on the internet? It's a good resource, by the way. There, there's an electronic concordance in the Blue Letter Bible and you can type in a word And it's going to spit you out a report of every time that word is included in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Before we had the internet, you know, we had to get out this big 50-pound concordance and we had to count words. You know, if we wanted to know how many times a certain word was used in the Bible, what form of that word was used, we had to use a concordance. But the reason we have concordance concordances, and the reason we have electronic things now is because the Masoretes started it all. So the Masoretes, they would count the words. They knew how many words were in each book. They knew how many words were in each section of Scriptures. Now let me ask you a question. Think with me here. Why was that important to the copying of Scripture? Why was that important? Quality to make sure. I'm, I'm hearing the same thing being whispered around you. Know, before the Masoretes did all of that, they would have a master copy and painstakingly they would copy Scripture. There would be someone who would read. There would be a room full of scribes that would write it out right to left and then they would look over it. But the Masoretes developed this system of actually locking it in. You know, it could be counted. You would know how many columns should be on a page, how many lines should be on a page. 
And so they really upped the game, so to speak, when it came to the copying of Scripture. So the Old Testament preserved by the Masoretes is what's now known as the Masoretic Text. So the Old Testament Masoretic Text is very much available. There are good copies because look where we're getting to here. You'll notice the date that I gave you a moment ago. Some of these were as recent as just a little over a thousand years ago. And so when you're getting back into that time, there's good things that are left behind. So there are all kinds of editions of Masoretic texts. So in this time frame, and I don't know if you're watching, but I've got this little ticker for you down here at the bottom. We're working our way up toward English copies of the Word of God. So I wanted to introduce you very briefly to the Masoretes. Now, I'm going to skip over some things, or this could become a year-long discussion. And we want to do other things and not just talk about this. I want you to know that before the year 300, there's evidence that Christianity had made its way into the British Isles. Now, why is that important to our conversation? Because we're doing all of this to begin to understand how you and I have these copies of the English Bible. So by the 300s, there's good evidence that Christianity, by the work of the early missionaries, was really spreading westward. It really shouldn't surprise you because, you know, if you just look to the south and even west of the British Isles, what do you have down here? What's that? Spain. That's Spain. Is Spain in the New Testament? Nod your head like this. Because Paul wanted to do what? He wanted to go all the way to Spain with the gospel. So it shouldn't surprise you that by 300, the gospel was already spreading into the British Isles, but the Anglo-Saxon pagans didn't like it. You know, there's always this thing. <laughs> it happened in Paul's missionary journeys. It happened in old England. When the gospel started getting there, the pagans didn't like it. There were a lot of pagans. Stonehenge? You know, Chevy Chase knocked over Stonehenge. <laughs> Not really. That'd be a lot harder to do than they made it seem in that movie if you watched it years ago. But Stonehenge is a pagan worship center. That's what it is. So the pagans didn't like it. They began to drive out the Christians down into Wales in between 450 and 600. In A.D. 596, you have a missionary that comes by the name of Augustine. It's not the same Augustine that was one of the early church fathers, but this Augustine came to the town of Canterbury. That's where he centered his work. He became known as the apostle to the English, and he renewed the efforts of bringing the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel to England. So the gospel is in England. The stories of Jesus, the stories of the New Testament, the doctrine of the New Testament is in England, and there's some early people who became very important. There was an illiterate monk by the name of Cademan. And Cademan began to retell the stories of Scripture through poetry and song. He would write, he wouldn't write them, but he would recite poets or poetry and, and sing songs and that's how a lot of people became acquainted with the stories of the New Testament and the doctrine of the New Testament. So Rodney, we're grateful for songwriters because the message is conveyed through song. It's a godly work. And that's how it did in England all those years ago before there was 
a written Bible. There was a man who was beginning to sing songs of the faith. And a man who would recite poetry of the faith. And that's how it would be passed along. There was a monk and a scholar by the name of Bede. It looks like Bede. It's pronounced Bede. He actually made an old English translation of just small portions of Scripture. And he died in about A.D. 735 while he was trying to produce a full English translation of of the Gospel of John. So we're beginning to see, don't lose this, we're beginning to see how the Word of God is starting to translate into the English language. First by song and poetry, and then you have another that comes along that's writing portions of Scripture, not writing, but translating portions of Scripture into Old English and trying to produce the Gospel of John. Portions of Scripture were translated into the English language in a variety of forms in this time frame, but here's what you need to see. There was no translation of the entire Bible into the English language until 1382. That's important. And you're going to see why in just a second. So you, you have songs being sung... You have poetry being recited. You have snippets of Scripture being translated, but you don't have any form of an English Bible until 1382. And I want to introduce you to a very, very important figure in church history, a man by the name of John Wycliffe. Maybe on commercials. I've not seen a commercial in a long time, but maybe you've heard of an organization called Wycliffe Bible Translators. That organization bears his name. Do you happen to know what is the purpose? It's a missionary purpose, but what is the purpose of the Wycliffe Bible Translators? Amen. The goal of Wycliffe Biblical Translation is the goal of getting the Word of God, what you and I take for granted, the Bible, what we have in our laps tonight, what I have on my computer, what we've read on the screen tonight. Just remember this, there are people all over the world that still don't have access to it. And so the Wycliffe Bible translators are working feverishly to make sure Scripture is in the vernacular of every language on the face of the earth. And it's a work that ought to be supported. But it bears John Wycliffe's name because he completed the first English Bible translated from Latin in 1382. Now, we say 1382. Folks, we've been talking about, in this whole study that we started several weeks ago, we've been talking about history from B.C. and early A.D., and now here we are all the way up to 1382, and here's my point in the grand history of the world. 1382 is fairly modern history. It's not ancient history, okay? So it was in 1382 that you find the very first Wycliffe English Bible translation. He inspired it. He oversaw it. He didn't do it by himself, but he worked with others to translate the Latin into the English. Here's what Wycliffe wanted. He wanted the people of England to have the Bible in their language. And aren't we thankful? that there was a man like John Wycliffe that wanted the Bible to be in English. Here's what he taught. He taught that Scripture, not church tradition, was the ultimate and final authority for the people of God. And that's exactly what we believe in our doctrine. 
the final authority for Bible Baptist Church is not your Constitution and bylaws. The final authority for Bible Baptist Church is the Word of God, right? Now, we're thankful for Constitution and bylaws. They have their place. It helps us to, to be in order, etc. But that's not where our final authority is. Our final authority is in the Word of God. And that's John Wycliffe. That was his heartbeat. The final authority is not in the Pope. Because you see, this is before the Church of England broke away from the Catholic Church. We'll talk more about that next week. But this is before all of that. And so Wycliffe is saying, people need the Word. People don't need to depend on a priest and only the priest in a community or a a town may be the only person that reads Latin. People don't need to depend on that because he knew that the New Testament taught the priesthood of believers, okay? That people could process and understand God's Word themselves. So Wycliffe became known as the morning star of the Reformation. We'll talk more next time about the Protestant Reformation, but just see this. Things are beginning to churn There's a new day coming for the church because the Reformation is on the way. His followers were called lollards or mumblers because in some of the Wycliffe translations of Scripture, they actually publish criticisms of some of the traditions of the church. And so people began to call these people weird, Jesus freaks, mumblers, lollards, to the point that there was such a fuss about what Wycliffe and others who wanted people to have the Bible into the English language, there was so much consternation about it that in 1408 in England, who still hadn't separated itself from the Catholic Church, it became illegal to translate or read the Bible in common language. Can you imagine that? The Bible has taken a major leap because of the efforts of a man named John Wycliffe, and then all of a sudden they say, you can't do that. Well, the Wycliffe Bible was banned. They were gathered up. They were burned. This is how seriously the church in England at the time took it. In 1428, 44 years after he died, they literally dug up Wycliffe's bones and burned his bones because they said he was a heretic. I ate Chinese for lunch. Stopped at a Chinese buffet and got a little bite of lunch today. And, uh, you know, it's kind of fun to open those fortune cookies. Do you know that anymore, when you open those up, you don't get much of a fortune. You get like advice or pithy statements, that kind of thing. But I knew what I was talking about tonight, and I thought, well, this is apropos. I opened up my little cookie, and listen to what it says. My fortune, right here. It says, To avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. There you have it, folks. If it's in a cookie, it's got to be true, right? That is true. That is true. You know, if you're going to try to do something that's worth the effort... If you're going to try to do something for the glory of God, it'll often be criticized. If you try to make a difference in an organization, for instance, a school or a a civic organization of any type, if you try to make a difference, you're going to be criticized. 
So if you don't want criticism, there's an easy route to it. Do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. John Wycliffe was not willing to do nothing, say nothing, or be nothing. He was something to contend with. He wanted people to be able to read and understand the Word of God for itself and for themselves. And so here's my cliffhanger tonight. Meanwhile, something's happening in Germany. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Gutenberg. Something's happening in Germany. That's where we'll start next week. All righty, folks. Let's talk about our prayer list. Um, if you picked up one tonight or had one in your Bible, what have you, if you need to make any comment on a name that we have there or make any additions, let's go ahead and share those.